You know, in some ways, his lectures in chapel, I've been watching the community as, as he gave those lectures, and uh, I got the sense that, that, that most of our students knew he was saying something really, really important, but maybe weren't quite sure what he was saying. <laughs> but they were leaning in to sort of try to catch it, and uh, it's kind of like a good book should be a little bit over your head and stretches you a little bit. Um, but for many of us, the things that, that, that he's been saying and sharing with us are really foundational to what we're doing as a Christian liberal arts college. That is, why do we do this? And uh, what is the theological underpinnings uh, for why the liberal arts are important and for why uh, Christian education as a, as a formative thing is so important? And how do, we, how do we warrant that theologically? And so he's done a lot of deep thinking about this and some of our conversations around the table and in small groups uh, have actually gone down to the nitty gritty of it. And uh, so this is the third actually in the, the series and one which we've sort of geared knowing there would be an athletic event tonight and knowing some students would come but that we would have faculty and staff uh, that's geared towards us in terms of how do we think through uh, Christian education theologically and how do we think it through in terms of Christian virtues and how do those things tie together. So uh, we're excited to have uh, Dr. Peterson with us. So let me open in prayer, and then um, we'll turn the floor over to him. Father, thank you so much for your self-revelation to us, that you, uh, who um, is the all-wise and glorious God, who exists as Father, Son, and Spirit, out of your love and your wisdom, have spilled out and created the world and uh, chosen in the mystery of who you are to create us in your image uh, that we might worship you and reflect your glory and that we might live in a way that reflects your wisdom. Uh, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the hope that he brings to a world that has gone awry because of rebellion and sin. How graciously uh, you have uh, expressed your love for us and provided redemption and hope uh, and then sent us your spirit that we might be conformed uh, to the true image, uh, to your true image uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity we have of studying together and working together as faculty and students and administration. And we thank you for this occasion in which we can reflect uh, more deeply uh, about Christian education. We thank you for Dr. Peterson and his family. And we pray that you would bless uh, this activity tonight. Uh, for our good and for your glory, and uh, even ultimately uh, for the well-being of the world uh, as we labor with you in your great mission in the world that others might know and love and worship you. So we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me again um, just say uh, how thankful I am for the hospitality of the whole community here. I have really enjoyed being here uh, for this week. And as I mentioned a couple of days ago, um, had a great time. Uh, I guess that was just yesterday. Well, I'm shocked. Okay, but uh, yesterday morning, uh, I mentioned that I had a great time with uh, my wife and uh, Christy and our youngest son, Justice, was here and we had a really great time. And again, thanks so much to um, Dr. Ebert for his friendship and also for the wonderful opportunity to be here um, and to have a chance to um, be with you again this evening. What I'm hoping to do is to uh, start some hopefully uh, helpful reflection and conversation uh, since you've already heard me lecture a couple of times the last couple of days, um, what I'd like to do is uh, get some conversation started by um, sort of working at this from a different angle, on the angle of virtue specifically. But hopefully we can have a little bit of back and forth as well, um, where, uh, as Anthony mentioned this morning, um, in, in chapel that there could be a time for question and answer and dialogue even uh, to where maybe I'll throw some questions back at you and we can brainstorm together and this kind of thing. I hope that that could be helpful. Um, so let me uh, start with a, um, an experience I had I guess just a couple, uh, well no, it's about a month ago um, with a 
a woman who had recently graduated from Columbia Teachers College in New York. And we were talking with her about education. And um, she had done her undergraduate degree as a part of Tori Honors Institute at uh, Biola University, but that's a great books program. And then she went to Columbia to study education. And what she said was, is that in her graduate program in education there, they talked a lot about virtues, but what they meant by virtues were just the aspects um, related to formation so that you could do your job well. Like it wasn't something that you needed, you didn't need to educate people for life, and in fact, by doing that, you're kind of going outside the bounds of what education is ultimately for. Um, if you're training people to do a job, then virtues are important because you need to be excellent at the skills um, that prepare you for that job. But really, those are sort of the boundaries of what an educational program can provide. And I think that we want to think about virtue and formation in a different way in a Christian context. And that's, that's something that I'm, I'm hoping to get at in our discussion tonight. So, um, surely, we all agree that we need certain virtues for jobs, like um, take the virtue of honesty. Uh, this virtue would help someone be a better colleague, because I'd rather have a colleague who is honest than one who is dishonest, right? Or something like that. That seems pretty obvious. But hopefully, again, we're, we're looking to sort of deepen our consideration of virtues. So, Mike Higton, uh, in a recent book called The Theology of Higher Education, um, says that all the disciplines in higher education are in fact moral economies. And what he means by that is to be trained in any discipline, whether it's science or history or literature. There are a whole set of rules, um, but also virtues that are expected for someone to function within that realm of um, study. And so inevitably, uh, as Stanley Hauerwas has noted, all educational institutions are moral, um, are concerned with moral education. They are forming students, whether that is sort of um, planned and intentional or whether it's accidental is another question, but that kind of formation is in fact happening. So the way that I've titled the lecture is Educating for Virtue, Why Christian Education Matters. And what I'm going to suggest is that we have a particular understanding of the virtues um, related to things that I've been talking about in chapel, related to the image of God and um, who God is and how he's uh, revealed himself to us in Christ, that then dictates what we think education ought to be and the form that that education actually takes. So I'll try to give you some suggestions of what I think that looks like as we proceed. Um, but before we do that, I want to just look at a biblical passage um, from the first chapter of Proverbs that discusses how these things hold together, how knowledge and virtue are related to each other, um, because it's laid out there in the book of wisdom. And I think that that's uh, very insightful into what we're actually aiming for with our Christian education. All right, so in Proverbs 1, it says that the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, are given for this purpose, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, for doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. And then, obviously, the key verse in Proverbs uh, 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So, what's going on here is that um, I think the scriptures are pointing out a um, reality about the way that knowledge and virtue hold together. Um, at times, and, and I read a couple of 
uh, articles and books to this effect uh, as I was preparing for these lectures. Um, people think that you can actually cultivate intellectual virtues, such as critical thinking, something of that nature, in a way that's separate from um, other kinds of virtues, moral virtues like love and charity and so on. Um, and it may be possible to bring into effect certain aspects of critical thinking without doing it in a loving way. Surely we could all agree with that. But um, what I think the scriptures are doing here by pointing out that wisdom, instruction, um, and insight is for the sake of doing what is right and just and fair is actually saying that these things cooperate together that in order for critical thinking to have its proper effect, it has to be in, um, uh, um, it has to complement or come together with and coordinate with goodness and justice and fairness and these kinds of things so that moral virtue and intellectual virtues are in fact um, uh, mutually necessary in order to exercise them well. So, so to exercise any one virtue, you have to develop in the other virtues also. This is going to raise uh, some questions, I think, that will be good for discussion later about how does a community, um, uh, a Christian college community like this one, intentionally shape students in these virtues? How, what kind of decisions would you have to make as you're developing a course that says, we want to develop charity not just in this class over here, but across the whole student's education. So what kinds of assignments do we need to give that will actually make students, or help, I, I can't say that you can make it happen, but you can help students develop the virtue of charity through a course assignment in your business class, or in your science class, or math class, or whatever. How do you actually cultivate virtues across the disciplines. And I think that this is going to be super important in the end for why Christian education matters because in other contexts, um, the lack of like uh, moral integrity, or I guess, uh, and I don't mean that people are immoral, I just mean that there's not a deep sense of integrity across all the disciplines that, that hold them together morally. So that your training in science might not teach you uh, the same morals as your training in philosophy and something else. They may actually pull you in opposite directions in various ways. Um, whereas in a Christian college, I think one of the goals is to have an integrated curriculum that actually then does help the student in a holistic fashion make progress along a, a way of training in the virtues that's coherent. Um, because then, again, if we can actually accomplish that, if that's possible to accomplish and we can do it, that goes a long way to explaining why I think Christian education matters as opposed to just education in general. Um, because there's a coherent kind of um, moral conviction that can be uh, learned along with your study in these various disciplines so that then when you graduate, you actually know not just about literature, but you know how to read virtuously and so on. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? Maybe. Okay. So let me read a couple of uh, quotes here um, that I think help us to uh, maybe get into this issue a little bit more. Uh, Mike Higdon's book uh, writes this. Regardless of questions about the precise content of the systems of virtue involved in academic life, formation in virtue is bound to take the form of apprenticeship. And this is something that I tried to emphasize uh, this morning as well, is I really think that we have to think of education as apprenticeship, and maybe this will be a different kind of, uh, again, education that is um, educational focus in a Christian liberal arts environment than we might have in a different kind of environment, and I'll explain that in a second. But as Lynn Holt says, um, in a system of virtue, excellence is primarily embodied in persons, 
and only secondarily in the products of their virtue. <clears throat> Excellent works and judgments or in codifications of what is um, what it is about their works that make them excellent disciplinary rules and recipes, so to speak. Even in mathematics, where the products are in one sense utterly rule-governed, excellence consists, first of all, of excellent mathematicians who are then capable of producing um, in ways that fit the rules and all that, such products and codifications. So what she's trying to say is that... Um, the excellences are not only in the product of your work, even as a mathematician, the excellence is in the person themselves. In other words, the virtues that enable them to produce the product that then is, is deemed excellent. So we have to think in terms of education as forming persons and again of um, forming excellences within persons. And that's what she's, us she's using the term excellences there to refer to virtues. Training for disciplinary excellence then uh, takes the form not simply of training in the following of rules and recipes, nor of the production of good works, but in becoming a certain kind of well-formed person. So, um, again, to put this into a broader context, uh, or I mean into, uh, I guess, specific context for you, uh, in business, again, to go back to that example, since I used that as an example this morning, um, it's not merely to figure out what works in business. It's not, you're not trying to just teach someone how to work within the system of business as it already exists, but you're hoping to form students who um, actually can be excellent business people even if their context changes, right? And then they can creatively adapt to that and then live out the virtues that they've um, sort of embodied and inhabited and been formed by, the dispositions that they've taken on, and then live them out in these new contexts that they find themselves in, whether they're new business contexts or, um, again, whether those things uh, are then lived out in lots of different contexts in life. So how does that even affect family life and so on? That's where I think we need to get away from um, thinking of virtues as merely related to work. Now, um, in contrast to what Higdon is saying, he's saying that we need to think about it in terms of apprenticeship. Um, and I'm to in total agreement with that. I think that's exactly how we need to think of it. Which changes, again, how you would do assignments. What kind of readings you have your students do. Because you're not just trying to have them access certain kinds of information, but you're trying to take them down the formation. And what someone might read to get some content might be very different than what they might read to sort of enter into um, the process of being tra transformed by that knowledge. So here's an example um, from last semester for me in my own teaching. Um, when it comes uh, to my theology class, uh, I had students read uh, Athanasius on the Incarnation of the Word of God. So I went back to Athanasius and had students read this fourth century text. Now, at first they struggled with it. It was certainly less easy than what um, I could have given them in lots of other different forms, right? To get at some of the same content. But because my primary interest is actually a kind of formation where I'm inviting, I'm apprenticing them in the whole task of scholarship, but also of like Christian reflection, I wanted to sort of shoot over their heads and make them grapple with something that they weren't able to grapple with yet. And then as they engaged that, it was amazing the kind of transformation that I actually saw happen throughout the semester. That was the first assignment. Throughout the semester, in all the rest of their papers, they were constantly referring back to Athanasius because a whole new world had been opened up to them because they were taken down a road they didn't even know existed, right? But that's a different kind of thing, I'm not trying to impart knowledge so much as take them on this journey of formation and now they're recognizing it as, wow, that actually changed how I even begin um, thinking about a question. And so I'm going to just keep referring back to it and hopefully they'll move on to other things as well. But there's an example, at least just in terms of um, practical application, where the whole goal of the assignment is this practice of formation rather than information in that sense. But um, Dorothy Sayers says this uh, in her 
uh, essay, The Lost Tools of Learning, which some of you might be familiar with. It's a very famous one. And it's, uh, but uh, I think it's insightful. She says, is not a great defect of our education today that although we often succeed in teaching our pupils subjects, we fail lamentably on the whole in teaching them how to think. They learn everything except the art of learning. It's as though we had taught a child mechanically and by rule of thumb to play the harmonious blacksmith upon the piano, which, is there any, are there any music teachers in here? I don't know the harmonious blacksmith, but I'm, I'm sure it's great um, and easy. But you never taught the student the scale or how to read music. So that having memorized the harmonious blacksmith, he still has not the faintest notion how to proceed from that to tackle the last rows of summer. Um, and so what she's, she's saying, and then there's a couple of other things that, um, well, I, I guess I will read the rest of it. I think it's helpful. Um, why do I say as though in, a, in certain of the arts and crafts, we sometimes do precisely this, requiring a child to express himself in paint before we teach him how to handle the colors or the brush. There's a school of thought which believes this is the, uh, to be the right way to set about the job. But observe, it's not the way in which a trained craftsman will go about teaching himself a new medium. He, having learned by experience the best way to economize labor and take the thing by the right end, will start off by doodling about on an odd piece of material in order to, quote unquote, give himself a feel of the tool. So she's also picking up this idea of apprenticeship um, and craftsmanship as a part of the educational process. That uh, we don't want to just uh, teach people to be excellent at one thing, but then you actually say, oh, now play this other song. And it's like, I don't know how to play the piano. I just knew how to play this one song, right? I didn't have the virtues necessary to do actual piano playing. And so, again, I think what is um, necessary here to understand what our goal has to be in terms of Christian education is this kind of uh, uh, apprenticeship, formation, craftsmanship that's being indicated here in these um, different articles. All right. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna, there's just two other quotes I want to add to that. Uh, for the sake of discussion here in a few moments. But uh, this is going back to Higdon's book now. He says this. Um, this implication, he says, of, of his philosophy of education that he's outlining here is a touchy one. It's that if teachers are teaching by imitation, embodying for their students the virtues of their discipline, and if one cannot neatly separate out well-defined intellectual or disciplinary virtues from other virtues of courage, honesty, reliability, and courtesy, then we cannot be indifferent to broader questions of virtue and responsibility among the teaching staff. Not again because a university needs to supply some moral formation alongside disciplinary and professional formation, but precisely because we claim to supply a disciplinary and professional formation. University teaching is inherently and unavoidably a moral endeavor. I think the insight here is really huge. Um, that uh, often, again, in our broader society, we have separated like private life from professional excellence, right? So who knows what's going on in, at someone's house, um, but as long as they come to work and do well, that's what really matters, at least in any public kind of way. Um, I think he's pointing out uh, well that if we can't really separate intellectual and moral virtues, if they are in fact bound to one another, then the life that is lived by the faculty is absolutely crucial to the success of the college um, in which they're serving. And that doesn't mean just like, are they decently good people? It means, are they really excellent in their own fields? Are they flourishing in their own disciplines? Because if you are um, not doing that, then how are you going to apprentice students in the virtues related to those fields, right? So if you're going to do that, you have to yourselves be inhabiting those virtues in a way that um, 
brings together the moral and the um, intellectual virtues necessary for your discipline. So um, students are imitating their, their uh, uh, <coughs> teachers and embodying then the, or the teachers are embodying for their students the virtues of their discipline. So again, um, that, that brings up this kind of uh, apprenticeship model uh, yet again. And then um, now I want to raise, I guess, uh, what would be, um, well, let me mention one more thing and just tie it back in with what I've been doing in the chapels and then I'll, I'll read this last quote and I think it'll be good to, for the sake of uh, discussion. Um, what I've tried to do over the last two days um, in chapel and talking about Genesis 1 through 3 is to introduce a way of thinking about the image of God um, that isn't just uh, recognizing that we're important to God or that we have dignity or something like that, but that it actually shapes all the decisions we make in life, that it um, makes us rethink who we are and what our identity is and then makes us creatively figure out ways of showing forth God's character in the world, right? Um, and so I've tried to spell that out through um, the four things that I mentioned there that education, like a coherent education provides, and that's knowledge of God, knowledge of the world, um, the cultivation of creativity, and then the development of virtue. So we're focusing on that fourth thing, but it's in conversation with all four of those aspects. And again, I think there's other reasons why Christian education matters on the front end, as we talked about in chapel this morning, that that's um, because uh, a Christian education can give theology its proper place. Um, but the focus of tonight then is on the fourth of those. And uh, again, this really has to do with human identity. We as human beings are on a journey. We're moving from this place to this. And I think Adam and Eve were even created like that. So when we talked about Genesis 2 and 3 today, I didn't say a lot about this, but just going back to that discussion. Adam and Eve were in the process of coming to know God, it seems to me. That he would walk with them in the cool of the day, right in the garden. And that they were themselves being conformed to the image of God as they were already made to be images of God in the world. But they, being human, were in the process also of becoming. And that's why they longed for wisdom. That's why she wanted to eat from the tree. And he did as well. Um, why they wanted the tree was because it was something they didn't have yet. They weren't fully... They hadn't fully arrived, right? They were in the process of becoming. If that's true that all of us are in the process of becoming, then again, um, that shows the importance of the development of virtue and the, the formational aspect of all education. Because it's not like I just need to download new information. You know, if I could put a computer in my brain and you could just stick it in there, you know, stick a... Uh, uh, jump drive or something in there and then now I, I have the knowledge, I need to actually be formed in virtue in order to even know what to do with that knowledge and to know how to use it and so on. So that's kind of what I'm working on here is that saying that's been true about us from the beginning and then it even gets exacerbated when sin comes into play. So in fact we've been formed in bad ways so that we use the knowledge that we do gain in ways that are unhealthy. So now we have to undo the vices and enter into the practices of virtue in order for us to do well in the world at, at, at um, uh, representing God and uh, living in, and flourishing as human beings. So that's kind of the, the, the structure that I'm working for here is, the, is this idea that formation fits into just what it means to be human in the first place. So I thought I'd bring this up because um, uh, it's where the pressure sort of falls on Christian education. So we have the virtues of it that I've tried to mention here. But we also have some pressures. Um, and one of them is this. Uh, 
Higdon is summarizing Gavin DaCosta's uh, analysis here, but he says, in the absence of other shared measures of value, the easiest available alternative measure is money. Gavin DaCosta addresses his book on higher education. To those who believe that the university might be other than the intellectual production line in the industrial halls of late postmodern capitalist society. Bemoaning the fact that finance is the chief criterion without any or organic vision of the relation of the different disciplines. So unless we recognize how these different disciplines hold together, then what's going to actually sort of drive any kind of institutional decision or anything is going to be finances. So without any organic vision of the different disciplines, without any shared values regarding the good of men and women, so again, without a clear conception of what we think human identity is all about and what it means to be a man or a woman, a human being, right? And what the formation is necessary for them. So without an organic sense of the disciplines, without the shared values regarding the good of men and women, or concerning the truth that might possibly be. So the third thing, uh, uh, or what, what truth might possibly be, without a clear idea of what truth is. Bound only by such an abstract Measure, measure of value, going back to that first comment, that people are talking about virtues outside of Christian environments, but um, we should have a different way of talking about them, a more organic um, Bound only by such an abstract measure of value, fragmentation, competi uh, competitive professionalism, and utilitarianism in the universities have no check. So fragmentation, competition and utilitarianism um, end up ruling. Money, the publicly exchangeable substance par excellence, takes the place left vacant by the impossibility of publicly exchangeable arguments about values. As John Milbank puts it, utter incoherence and lack of ability to withstand the critical trials of reason does not matter so long as one can come up with cash and customers. So the challenge, uh, I think, that we're all trying to figure out in Christian education right now, especially as we think about um, as public education at the university level becomes even more prominent, uh, perhaps at the um, junior college level or whatever else. The challenge is to think about how to hold on to that organic vision and how to root it in the real good of men and women, um, and then also in a real lively and compelling conception of truth, and to allow those things to then make all the disciplines in the liberal arts flourish. Um, if we can't do that, then what at least is suggested here and in a lot of the data that I've um, looked at, like in the Chronicle of Higher Education and um, some other publications of that nature, fragmentation seems inevitable and also just strict professionalization becomes inevitable because the goals get dislocated from this um, uh, sense of coherent virtue. Okay, so that's the challenge. Uh, that's really what I wanted to present this evening and uh, now I'd like to, I guess, open it up for any questions that you guys might have, either about discussions we've had during the chapels or this discussion. Um, but I would also really love to hear some of your reflections on education, some of the challenges to actually bringing this about and, and those kind of things. Um, so let me open it up for questions or comments. Yes? What is an organic vision? What he's referring to is that um, the, the, the justification of the different aspects of the vision are organic in the sense that they come um, from the primary convictions about what's good for a human being. So that once we've identified what's good, and this is what I've been trying to get at with the whole idea of recognizing people's identity as the image of God and all that, 
if we recognize how people are being formed, that then dictates what kind of formation we think is helpful for them. Um, so that it's organic to these other sort of foundational commitments that we've already made, rather than merely pragmatic. Um, so organic rather than pragmatic in that sense. So it's not like you just try to cover the base that needs to be covered, um, but you actually have sort of a um, coherence to, to why you're doing what you're doing. It's connected to your ultimate vision for what you think is good for people. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. What would you say is the role of community in a Christian higher education context? And I say that, I guess, in the context of a lot of proliferation of online education or highly individualized education mm. where you can live on a campus or you know, interact with other students. Visiting a lecture becomes a spectacle rather than a, a dialogue in a lot of larger schools. What's the importance, if any, of community in learning? Yeah, I think this is a fabulous question. And, and this gets back to something I was hoping to mention, so I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, often in like an R1 institution, you know, a research one, so like the big name schools, you'll go to a lecture and it, I mean it's a huge lecture hall and the professor is only there just to kind of give one lecture a week or whatever and then you end up um, being taught by uh, the teaching assistants right for for that professor but the professor has research to do that that's the whole existence of that school is for the sake of research not really for teaching um, and so your interaction with a professor isn't as isn't as great in that sense. Now there's other virtues there in terms of like training the TAs as they're developing. Um, now they're able to instruct people. So I mean there there's some good um, virtues that you could point to in that context anyway. But you're you're nailing something huge about what I think um, a Clearwater Christian College could offer, and that is a whole learning community. And I suggested this morning that actually faculty need to see themselves as a part of the learning community, not just a part of the teaching community. That um, professors are learners, and what you're doing is actually bringing your students into your learning um, and saying, wow, this is how you do it. These are the skills and the practices that are normal in my discipline to do it well. So I'm not here just to tell you something I know. I'm here to grab you by the hand and, and show you the path and get you running down it. Um, and I think that's a real different sort of vision. So that's in the sense of the community between faculty and students, but then also among students and students. Um, recognizing that that personal formation is far more than just information means that uh, we need this to be a, ho a holistic communal practice where you're learning and benefiting from the learning of your neighbor and so on, um, which again in a Christian environment I think we have all kinds of resources even in ecclesiology maybe that we could point to to help us understand how that works. Yeah. Use an example of classroom assignments, the goal of which might be virtue formation. How would you apply that, or perhaps you just brainstorm for us, the students' role in that? So I, I think perhaps a faculty member may or may not be able to grasp what they just might be in that kind of thing. If you're a student in a class and you're trying to proceed with your own mm. task as forming yourself virtuously or pursuing virtues, what then would he or she um, be doing, or what mindset would you suggest, or anything like that? Yeah, that's really good. So, uh, let's go back to the example of reading Athanasius, just because uh, that was a particularly successful version of this, at least towards certain kinds of virtues that I was aiming for. Um, what I was choosing there, and so now I'm not answering your question directly, but I will in a minute. I'll get back to the student side, but let me just start by telling you, I guess, as a, the professor side. I was choosing a text that I knew actually was far more integrated in terms of its devotional, in the sense that it's like, it's worshipful. It's also incredibly deep theology. It's um, got some uh, even... 
uh, difficult and unfamiliar sort of philosophical uh, assumptions maybe at work in it at places where uh, students are gonna sort of have to wrestle with that um, and so one of my goals is to develop this idea of charity hearing voices other than your own and being willing to receive them and learn from them uh, even when um, it's not what you had previously uh, sort of thought or whatever. Now to get over to the, so, the, so this is kind of where I'm at work and I'm having them write a paper, but really the paper in one sense is only to show me that they did the work that I wanted them to do. The work is actually the reading and the wrestling, right, through the ideas, because that's what's forming them. And then they put it down on paper to show me that they've done that. But really at the end of the day, um, there are other places where I want their writing to be the primary thing that I'm checking, but here I'm, I'm wanting them to enter into this journey. Okay, now I guess what I want my student to do is uh, to cultivate a couple of virtues um, specifically um, with related to that, related to that assignment, um, a kind of patience and attentiveness uh, that allows them to listen and not just listen, you know, that sort of initial listening and then it, it's like, well, this doesn't make sense to me, I give up. But like a persistence as well. So I guess a, a patient endurance to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work with this for a while. I'm gonna wrestle with this and let it have its effect. Um, again, a kind of charity that allows um, outside voices to be heard and um, uh, for you to be challenged and transformed by that. And then uh, also higher order learning skills like uh, analysis and synthesis, you know, like so he's bringing together a whole bunch of things that they know about the biblical story, but in a way they hadn't seen it combined. And so it's like, okay, here's a new challenge to how to pull all this together, which hopefully will strengthen their own skills at both analysis and synthesis and so on. So those are my goals for the student. And what I'm hoping the student is doing, I guess, is when I tell them that that's what I want to see, I want them to, to sort of buy into that and recognize that they're on a journey of formation, not merely completing an assignment um, and thinking that just completing it is sort of doing the task of education. So I guess what, I, what I'm thinking for the students' sake is that they think of themselves as on a journey through the work, not merely as checking off boxes to get things done, um, because that would sort of remove all of the formative aspects of that. Or I guess you'd still be formed by it, but only accidentally rather than intentionally. But, but it might come down to uh, the faculty not being able to really trust that students will intentionally do that. So you have to be really intentional then about the kinds of assignments you pick because um, basically you need to dictate what virtues they're learning even when they don't know it. Yes? In the type of questions you ask about the assignment, sort of guide them directly. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. So the other thing that I do in my own teaching, and, and everyone's um, teaching strengths are different and um, there's lots of different teaching models but one of the things that I intentionally do is I just refuse my, to allow my students to be passive learners um, so I very rarely uh, just like lecture through a class or something I might set up an issue but then most of the time in class is, is actually me posing questions and then them having to sort of solve that and wrestle together with it so that they can learn from each other, learn from me in the process, and I'll interject and redirect the conversation. But it's a much more back and forth, because again, my goal is to bring them into my learning community. So I'm trying to say, until you start asking the questions I'm asking, until you, and I, and I mean, I don't mean that in a forceful way, like I want you to only think like me, but what I mean is is that, until you start at least thinking like me and in, in, in thinking, oh, this should lead me to this question, this should lead me to that one, I'm assuming that I have somewhere to bring them, so I do want them to become habituated in asking the kinds of questions I ask uh, and then seeking the answers in the ways that I want the, you know, think the answers should be sought. Um, but because of that, 
it's definitely what I do in class is actually try to be very intentional about the kinds of questions that I ask in order to draw students into that process. Exactly. Yes? To be able to do that then, um, you almost had to have like a flipped classroom where you yeah. have the majority of the responsibility in reading the text. Usually I would give them a worksheet with the kinds of questions on it that, I, that will hopefully shape their ideas in the right direction. Yeah. But the class period itself is a question and answer time. Um, if they haven't prepared, then they can't discuss, then they're not going to feel a part of the class. But it's very difficult to help students recognize that their intellectual activity is really important in a classroom context. Yeah. They have something to contribute to the intellectual setting. They're so used to, I guess, just being given stuff and they yeah. Get a test. yeah. They don't understand that the active intellectual give and take is really, really important and they have to participate. Yeah, that's exactly stuff. right. If this is more like apprenticeship and I'm the blacksmith, right? And I'm just sitting there beating swords every day. But the thing is, is that they've never picked up a hammer. They actually haven't learned the virtues of how to make a sword. They maybe have watched me make a million of them, but they haven't made one yet. And so um, you're exactly right that actually the classroom has to, in some ways, be turned back into a laboratory to let them practice these things. Or think of it in terms of weightlifting. Like um, I took a weightlifting class in high school and I was terrible at it. I mean, look at me. But anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so, um, and I was even, you know, like then I was just really toothpick. So, uh, you know, there's all these people like growing in tons of strength and I just hated it because it was like embarrassing and stuff. But um, the point is, is like, you still have to start lifting weights no matter what point you're at, even if you're not very good at it and there's someone else who's lifting a lot of weights. And that's, that's another struggle. Because you can kind of put the, um, put some burden on the students to be active learners, which I think you absolutely have to do. But then the thing is, is that certain ones will try to bear most of the weight. And a couple of students will be like, ah, you know, I'm not so confident and I'm just going to fall back. And you have to find ways of making every single one of those students an active learner. How are you going to apprentice all of them? And, and that's where like class sizes come into play and all this kind of stuff is really important because you have to be able to uh, bring everyone into active learning. Yeah, that's, that's a great observation, yeah. I yes. have a quote here by the safe author of A.W. Tozier. He died in 1963. And he basically summarized and end what we're saying here. I'm just going to read part of it. What the learner contributes to the learning process is fully as important as anything contributed by the teacher. Hmm. If nothing is contributed by the learner, the results are useless. At best, that will be but the artificial creation of another teacher who can repeat the dreary work on someone else to, the, to infinity. <laughs> yeah, that's good, that's good. The perception of ideas, rather than the story of them, should be the aim of education. The mind should be an eye to see with, rather than a fin to store facts in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he started off by saying, no man can teach another, he can only aid that person to teach himself. Mm -hmm. That's basically, I think, what you're trying to bring out. It is, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think I am trying to point to those things and, and try to say that what, it, what that requires. That yeah, yeah. No, that, that's exactly right. So that, that fits that point. But I think what is the difficult point here is that uh, it's hard to actually do that in a coherent way as an entire college so that I have to sit down w with, you know, like, um, with a colleague and say, okay, we really want this virtue developed over the next four years, so what are you going to do to contribute to that? What am I going to do to contribute to that? How are we going to shape the advance of this student's development in that virtue? And if you don't do that, then I have to say, here's the real problem. You end up with the same kind of fragmentation as any other school, and then why 
come to the Christian school, right? The thing is, is that hopefully if we offer a coherent vision of what that moral life should be like, we also have to have a coherent program that then develops those virtues. And so you've nailed, you know, I think you guys have <laughs> nailed exactly what I'm getting at in terms of the apprenticeship aspect, but it takes a really uh, deep commitment of all the faculty to do this in a coherent way. And that is a... It has to be a kind of motivation. Yeah. What's the motivation for learning for the, for the teacher and the student? What's the motivation? Yeah, yeah. Just to learn facts or for what reason? And, and hopefully that comes down to what we were saying before uh, from that quote, like understanding what the good of humanity actually is. And not just in a humanistic way, obviously. That's why I was talking about the image of God the last couple of days is ultimately this is rooted in God himself and his intention for us as human beings. <coughs> seems. So, um, if there are, uh, like, here are some, here are some uh, disciplines that I was thinking of, or virtues, that need to be instilled. How would we actually uh, again, do this in a coherent way. So charity is one that I've talked about. But what about something like self-sacrifice? If ultimately we think at um, the root of the is the fact that God sent his son to give himself for us, right? And then um, in the process he's claiming us and bringing us into his own life, that kind of uh, generosity and self-sacrifice is something that we think is necessary in order to be Christian, but also in order to do any of our uh, professions well and any of our disciplines well. Then how do you create assignments that develop someone's self-sacrifice? Hel helping them to become self-sacrificial. I'm not answering that. I'm saying that, that that's a, a question that I think is worth thinking hard about. How about, again, patience? Um, in a culture that is just absolutely militant against being patient, if we really think, though, that it's a Christian virtue, if it's a necessary thing in order to be the kind of person God wants you to be, how do you create assignments that don't just torture them into being patient, but actually cultivate patience in a healthy well, way. Tribulation works patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I didn't write the Bible. Right? <laughs> <laughs> How about, um, like, care for the world? So outside of yourself, this goes to the self-sacrifice thing, but not even just just that. And I don't mean just kind of like, should we be green or not? But I mean actually care about the world in um, tangible ways, uh, the world of humans, but also the rest of creation. Like how do you build that into your assignments? Not just that you lecture on it once in a while and mention it offhand, but again, in the things that the students are being formed by, how is this a value that's actually reinforced. If we're told to rule the world in a way that represents God, this would be a really important thing to think about in terms of an assignment. Um, and, and a whole set of assignments, a whole curriculum is what I'm saying. Um, and then, uh, again, not even just self-sacrifice, but aiming at someone else's formation. So recognizing yourself as the image of God as someone who's being formed, but also that the way you interact with other people is in fact either helping or hindering their formation. So what kinds of communal um, and, and community practices will reinforce um, their ability, you know, the student's ability to actually benefit one another in their formation, not just for them personally, but even for their peers, um, and for that matter, faculty. Uh, how do faculty and staff reinforce one another's formation in ways where they help each other keep on progressing in these virtues so that then they can bring students along with them. Um, and so all that to say, I think that this really is a totalizing kind of vision that then helps you to make sense of why all the liberal arts are important 
because it is holistic formation in all these different areas and why specifically Christian this Christian vision is there but only if it's really coherently worked out all right any other questions there I don't want this to oh it's already eight o'clock okay so um, is that is that time then <laughs> well uh, give Dr. Peterson a round of applause oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you very much for being with us. We very much appreciate it. And hopefully we've all uh, benefited, benefited from it. And I guess we will know, come uh, faculty evaluations, how much you benefited from him, <laughs> you know, et cetera. So, uh, Mr. Carver, would you pray for us as we conclude? Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to stimulate one another in our thinking, in our teaching, opportunity we have, the great privilege we have, to be used in a way, a significant way, to shape the lives of our colleagues and of the young people who committed to us, so that their lives might be lived to the glory. Like they mentioned in the <coughs> first message that he gave to us, the importance of tell us importance of the goal for a And I just thank you for the way that's been so simply formulated in the Westminster Catechism as it means to is to glorify God to enjoy the bread. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to glorify you in the way that we do our work. I pray that you would mold our students' lives by the word of God. And Lord, we, we recognize the fact that without you we need to know our best intentions, our best efforts will fall far short unless you choose to pour out your blessing upon us and you choose to work through us. And Father, I pray that you do that. And you would be pleased to do that in this college, in our lives individually, and in every single life that we touch, whether it be colleagues, Amen. I'll have a nice weekend.